Nearly 10 years ago, I was completing a medical training in obstetrics. It was a typical spring day. I'd been up for nearly 28 hours. The operative team and I had just begun the second C-section of the morning. We delivered a beautiful baby and handed it to the waiting nurse, and I was preparing to close up one of the layers when I felt sharp pain in my left hand, specifically my thumb. I withdrew. It only lasted a moment. As I looked down, my gloved hand was filling up with blood. In my sleep-deprived state, it took me a few moments to realize what had just occurred. And then I was able to process and realize that I did not properly secure the needle in the instrument I was using. I asked for another glove to be placed on top of the first. The needle was exchanged. The surgery was continued. With some haste after the completion of the case, I went over to the patient's chart and was very relieved to find out that she did not have any infectious diseases. Had she had HIV or hepatitis, the outcome could have been different. I actually thought of a resident physician I knew who just a few years prior had been stuck with a dirty needle. Sadly, he had contracted hepatitis and passed away. I thought of my wife. I thought of my three young children at home. Uh, this was a sobering experience indeed. This experience uh, caused me to reflect. Why did it occur? I was absolutely exhausted and sleep deprived. I'd learned from this experience and sadly many, many experiences since sense. The important principle that to be your best, you need your rest. We're taught since we're children that we need our sleep, yet how many of us truly believe that as manifest in our daily behavior and our actions? There was a recent study, a Gallup study, a Gallup poll rather, where Americans were asked and over 40% acknowledged that they were sleep deprived, obtaining less than the seven hours recommended each night. Why does this occur? I submit it's because we're taught in our life a fallacy, a lie, if you will, that in order to get ahead, we need to give up our sleep. We're taught these throughout our lives. Benjamin Franklin, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Sounds great in theory, but the problem is most of us struggle with the early to bed part. Thomas Edison said on many occasions, sleep is an incredible waste of time. I often wonder if Mr. Edison had got more sleep, maybe he would have discovered the light bulb sooner. <laughs> maybe he would have been less cantankerous to work with, according to those who worked with him that were grateful for his inventions. Margaret Thatcher, the revered prime minister of uh, England for over 10 years, said, sleep is for wimps. She was proud to declare that she slept only four hours a night, although I do find it somewhat humorous that she blocked out her schedule to allow for a one to two hour nap every afternoon. Bon Jovi, one of my personal favorite rock artists, came out with a new album in 1992 while I was still in high school and with a hit single, I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. How many of us have been guilty of repeating that fantastic lie, often in a haughty and an arrogant manner? And my personal favorite, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the great American poet and educator, said these immortal words, the heights of great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, toiled upwards in the night. I came across this as a young college student. It inspired me so much, I wrote it on a three-by-five card, and I put it at the front of the desk that I studied each night and afternoon. It inspired me to stay up way into the night and off times in the early morning hours, looking over very enjoyable classics like calculus and organic chemistry and physics. Uh, and it also helped me to get up early the next morning. It's not that... Doing heroic things from time to time is bad. Our country was founded on such heroic actions where individuals gave up their rest. I think of Paul Revere and those who rode with him, including my eighth great-grandfather, warning the colonists and the militia that the British was coming. I think of Charles Lindbergh, the great aviator, the pioneer that he was, flying across the Atlantic on a dark night. I think more commonly of the mothers who sacrifice their sleep in order to attend to a young child. These are actions that truly should be celebrated, but the problem is that they become far too commonplace in our life. There are several complications that can occur with sleep deprivation. Starting with our minds, we become delayed in our ability to remember things. We become more impulsive. We become more impatient. Our creativity is lessened. We're also less likely to uh, be as effective with our time. We're, we're like, more likely to waste away the day 
Um, like today, just watching college football games. But there's also some either, even greater harm. We can make some significant mistakes. There was a study recently performed that showed that those who had gone 24 hours without sleep were equivalent to individuals with a blood alcohol level of 0.1%. That's more than legally drunk. To be our best, we need our rest. There's also several physical problems that can have significant effects on our cardiovascular system. We're more likely to gain weight. Perhaps we'll be, be, we're more impulsive eating things that we shouldn't eat at times that we shouldn't eat them, but we're more likely to develop heart disease such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol. We're more likely to have heart attacks and strokes. We're also more likely to develop diabetes. Additionally, we're more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. On the world stage, the manifestation of sleep deprivation has been significant in our time. On the top left, we're reminded of the Challenger shuttle disaster. I was eight years old. I remember sitting in, my, in the front of my school classroom, eyes fixed on the television, excited to see a historic moment in time. Sadly, after the space shuttle took off, an explosion occurred, and all occupants were, were killed. As they looked at this afterwards, why did this happen was the question that was asked. It was discovered that some senior managers were going on less than two hours of sleep, had approved the use of an O-ring attached to the fuel vessel that had not been properly tested in sub-zero temperatures. In the top right, we're reminded of Chernobyl, the greatest nuclear disaster of its time. Shift workers had been working 13 hours straight without a break for several days on end. The bottom left, we're reminded of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, the greatest oil disaster of its time. Those working along that barge had been working for 22 hours straight. More commonplace to each of us, the roadside accidents that occurred today. One out of six fatal accidents is the result of sleep deprivation. That's 10,000 lives in America alone lost each year. One in particular stands out in my mind. I was a young physician. I had just taken my first job in a small Idaho town. I was on call for the emergency room. I got the call that an ambulance or two were going out to a head-on collision. There was already one fatality at the scene. Into the ER came a frightened and scared and badly injured little girl, a young lady, 13 years old. She had facial lacerations and glass throughout her body. With time and effort, we were able to stabilize her injuries, and with time, she was able to be physically killed. Sadly, her mother was the individual who was killed at the scene. To add to the tragedy, her father had just passed away a few months prior from cancer. Why did this happen? This was not the result of an individual drunk driving. This was not due to a teenager texting, but rather this is a kind older man who had fallen asleep at the will. To be your best, you need your rest. What's happening in our minds when we sleep? Neuroscientists decades ago postulated a theory that our brains were much like an automobile. We drive it all day long and then we turn off the keys and it rests throughout the night. In recent years, with advances of neurotechnology, we've learned there's more to that. We've learned that a better analogy might be it's that of a computer. The monitor goes off at night, but it's still working. Auto updates are being performed. Our amazing mind is taking experiences and memories and events of that day and incorporating with experiences that we've already developed throughout our life. It's also a time of rest and renewal for our bodies. Just as the belief that we need more sleep is universal, so also is the belief that we just don't have enough time to get it. The reality is, each of us do. It begins with an honest introspection into our life and evaluating how we're using our time and making course changes necessary in order to reclaim this important necessity in our lives. I'd like to share a few with you. A lot of them seem fairly intuitive, but I'd like to share some evidence-based principles on these. We must unplug. Studies have shown that individuals who are using their electronic devices, which emit blue light up into the hours that they sleep, have a much harder time not only falling asleep, but then staying asleep throughout the night. They've also well established that individuals who do anything in bed, be it electronic devices, reading books, watching TV, have a much harder time. Our brain is so incredibly intelligent, it disrupts our innate circadian rhythm. We need to shut those things down. 
where able, it's best to get electronics out of the bedroom altogether. If you have an alarm clock that's bothering you as you're looking at throughout the night, turn it down on the dimmest setting and turn it away from you. In our home in the last year, we've purchased a device that turns off the Wi-Fi at a set time. My wife and I are fans, our kids, uh, less so at this time. But it's something that's really helped us to reclaim this important principle of sleep. Dark, cool, and quiet. This is referring to our bedroom environment. Seems intuitive, let me elaborate. It's important that we avoid extraneous light as that also can disrupt our circadian rhythms. It's also important to have a very cool environment. This is something that we've not already done, we've not always done, but have incorporated the last year. Studies show that the ideal sleep temperature is 65 degrees, much cooler than most of us are accustomed to. They've looked at restful states of human beings and individuals who sleep less than 55 or greater than 75 aren't able to get the same love rest as those who stay at 65. As we've incorporated this into our house in the last year, it's made a significant difference. It's also important to have a wind down routine. My next slide elaborates further on this. Specifically, it's important to start that ritual. I'm not necessarily uh, referring to humming in a yoga pose, although if that helps you relax, great. But more importantly, is having something that's gonna help you to wind down. If you're stressed about the events of the next day, perhaps a TED talk, it's important to make sure you're addressing those things before it's time to wind down. It's also important to wear bedtime clothing. Individuals who are saying to themselves, I'm going to get to the gym the next day and put on those clothes, our, bed, our brain once again gets confused. It's important to be able to wind down properly. And lastly, I just put avoid caffeine, but it's a little bit more involved in that. Any stimulant. Recent studies have shown that individuals who consume caffeine as early as late as 12 p.m. can have some residual effects affecting their sleep. I'm not saying you have to avoid it altogether, but if you're going to use caffeine, strive to avoid after using it after noon. Individuals were, who took it within six hours of bedtime had a, up to an hour of lost sleep as a result. Other things, this isn't a religious creed, but evidence-based medicine that shows tobacco, which we know is a stimulant, but also alcohol, historically used as a nightcap, can have a rebound effect four to six hours later, waking up the, uh, the user of such. My wife could attest that this is true in our home. I don't want to sleep like a baby. I just want to sleep like my husband. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't just briefly address when medical, medical treatment is necessary. As a general rule, when behavior modification fails, when our lifestyle changes are not working, or our symptoms are atypical or severe. Specifically, if you notice your spouse is breathing irregularly or stops breathing for several seconds, that could suggest sleep apnea, and it might be beneficial to talk to your primary care physician. Furthermore, if you're waking up in a cold sweat, hot flashes, that may be a sign of a hormonal imbalance where a conversation with your provider may be beneficial. Other things, if you're having a difficult time turning off your mind, even filled with anxiety before bed or throughout, that could suggest some underlying anxiety and depression where an evaluation may be beneficial. William Wordsworth said, the world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature, that is ours. The world is too much with us. I wonder what the world would be like if we were to reclaim this important principle of sleep. I submit it'd be a world where we'd be more well-rested. Uh, it'd be a world where we'd be more patient. We'd definitely be physically healthier and stronger, less disease. We'd be kinder to our loved ones and those we associate with. We'd have better ideas. We'd be able to make more of an impact, have deeper relationships, and have a life more worth living. Thank you.